Hi, thank you so much, Peg and Cass, for having me. It's so fun, and I'm so excited about this project that you have launched and birthed. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to read from um, a novel that just came out in paperback. Uh, it's called Little Nothing, and I, it needs a little bit of prep because it's really strange, and so it's not something you'll readily understand, jumping in the middle. It takes place, um, it, it's kind of a fable-like story, and it takes place in the early part of the 20th century in some indeterminate time in some indeterminate part of Eastern Europe. And um, it's about a little girl who's born to an older couple, and when she's born, she's born a dwarf. And um, they're, they live in a, in a village in the middle of nowhere, and they're not particularly knowledgeable or, or uh, educated about things that might be happening in the more modern world. And they decide to try to have her stretched. Um, and so they do, and, you know, and do this, and have her stretched, and, and um, it works. But um, when she grows, she not only gets tall, but she begins to, her features begin to change. And she takes on a rather sort of lupine, wolf-like quality. And not knowing what to do with her, they um, essentially sell her to kind of a carnival shyster, who then takes her around to various villages and uses her as a um, attraction. So we are now in the, it's a very normal story. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna lead right into um, when she is uh, at, at a carnival and she's about um, 15 now and she is with this shyster guy whose name is Smetanka and with his assistant whose name is Danilo who is a, a, a lovely, innocent, um, kind of feckless young man. After that night, Pavla, her name is Pavla's, performance changes. When Danilo removes the cape, instead of simpering and pretending to be ashamed and then roaring for effect, she simply stands motionless, looking out at the audience. She waits out the horrified shrieks, the gasps, the catcalls, and stoning until that dangerous energy is spent. At that point, the audience, no longer allowed to engage with her as an act, must come to different terms with the fact that she is a living truth no more fantasy than those who look upon her. Her stillness, her unwillingness to prance and perform become a different sort of confrontation that makes them feel less superior, vulnerable even, as if their own masks have been violently ripped away and now the truth of their ugliness and their distorted desires are on display for Pavla to see. Each night as the women drop their hands from their eyes, as the men stop leaning into one another to tell their nasty jokes, Pavla sees in their faces not ghoulish pleasure, but confusion. Why is she staring at them? What horror does she see? She watches as even the most obstreperous of them wither, their shoulders turn inward, their eyes cast about for reassurance. They grab one another's hands. People leave quietly as they do the confessional, and then they buy a ticket for the next show. <laughs> Smetanka is delighted by the turn of events. Word spreads in advance of their arrival in the new town. The carnival's most reliable acts, Marvolius, the combustible man who could make smoke, smoke come out of his ears and nostrils uh, before flames burst from the top of his head. Evo, the fish boy whose mother has sewn flippers onto his back to go with the thin-like hands he was born with, and three-breasted Magdalena, and even Juliska, and Pablo feels a bit guilty about this, they lose patrons to the wolf girl. Each night, the lines in front of Smetanka's tent are the longest of them all. Pavla stops badgering Danilo about leaving. After all, she has no argument. They are neither of them indentured to the doctor, and yet both of them stay. Danilo does not walk her to the caravan after the show. She supposes he has gone to the tent Smetanka visits to drink and perhaps find a woman he can pay to do what she is too scared to do. Nights are freezing now. And once she's inside the caravan, she lies down, still bundled in her coat. She worries about what will happen to her. The towns are shuddering for winter. Most people will not earn money until planting season. And when even the most debauched and desperate visitors can't afford the price of a ticket, Smetanka will not be able to pay for even the few coins he does now. She can't go home and make her parents' lives more difficult. She has nowhere to go. Maybe she could trade her services as a housekeeper in exchange for a room until the season begins again. 
She laughs at her preposterous optimism. Who would hire her? She will have to sell herself to the lowest kind of men who would find her an erotic thrill. She has heard women complain about the treatment they receive at the hands of their drunk husbands and lovers and the carnival horrors. Women with bruised faces, women who cannot walk properly for a week after a rough night. She remembers her mother's stories about the monster and the sausage. She begins to drop off to sleep. With Danilo, it would be so sweet. Such intensity to his gaze as if he is always on the verge of telling her something she wants to hear. She closes her eyes and lets herself imagine his hands on her face, the face of her girlhood, when she was the pride of the village with her azure eyes and golden hair and small body. His hands pass over her shoulders and her chest and then they move down. She unbuttons her coat. She pulls up the hem of her dress and finds the warm skin of her belly. Her fingers slide beneath the waistband of her underwear. She lays a hand on the fur that is meant to be there, that all women have. The caravan door squeaks open. She hears footsteps, the rustle of cloth. Her Danilo, he's come. He's foregone the prostitutes, he's come back. You will find love, the fortune teller told him. He must realize that he already has, that she is here, that she has summoned him with her thoughts. His hand is on her arm. Danny, she whispers. He moans. She feels the warmth of his fingers on her skin. When he runs his hands over the numb scars in her armpits and around her groin, she feels nothing. But the insensitivity only makes the feeling of his fingers on the undamaged parts of her all the more exquisite. She feels the weight of him as he moves on top of her, as his leg parts her thighs. He exhales heavily. His breath smells of... She opens her eyes just as Smetanka grabs her crotch. She screams and tries to push him off her, but he's too heavy. She cries for Danilo, but he does not come. Smetanka spits into his hand and reaches down and pushes himself at her, groping for entry. She opens her mouth to cry out one last time. Then just as he, about, as he is about to enter her, she closes her jaw around his neck and sinks her teeth into his skin. The taste stuns her. It is as if she has been starving and finally had her first bite of meat. She clamps down to secure his neck between her jaws and then shakes her head back and forth to loosen the meat from the bone. And now she can think of nothing but eating more, filling her belly to steel herself against the oncoming winter. Effortlessly, she throws him off. She mounts his cowering body and attacks his face. She swallows and goes for his stomach, his thighs. She turns him over and bites down on the fleshy mounds of his buttocks. When she is finished and there's nothing left of him but bone and sinew and hair, she lifts her head and howls. The bullet is lodged in her flank. She twists around and licks the wound, trying to dislodge the nugget of metal, but it is wedged in too deep. She should never have gotten hurt. She should have been nimble and swift and able to run well out of reach of the mob, but the meat she ate in the caravan was stewed in the same foul brew that drenches the sweat of her pursuers, and it has made her slow. Now, as she begins to move again, she feels as if she were pushing her paws through deep mud, even though the ground is cold and hard. A day ago, the first snow fell, and although it melted quickly in the open fields here in the forest, where despite a bare canopy, the sun seldom penetrates, its patchworks the ground and gathers and drifts at the bases of trees. The cold feels welcome on her paws, and when gusts of icy wind whip through the branches and seep into the outer layer of her fur, the dullness of her body abates, and she feels physically alert. She wants to roll around in the soft snow and numb her flank, to eat mouthfuls of the stuff to moisten her dry tongue, but she hears the snap and splinter of wood then heavy bodies crashing through thickets. They have been following her trail of blood, and now they are close. She lifts her snout and opens her jaw. The sound begins as a silence in her chest as the bellows of her lungs expand. She tilts her head back to make more space in her throat. The sound needs to travel. She doesn't know how far. For a moment, she hesitates. She is alone and injured. The men are near. Her sound will lead them right to her, but she will not survive on her own. The note vibrates in her gullet and against the roof of her mouth. It starts low, and then her throat constricts so that it rises up the tree trunks, up to the top of the leafless branches, growing louder as it flies into the frigid white sky, just like the flock of birds that passes overhead. She waits, her ears twitching forward, listening. But she hears only the footfalls of men and now their voices. 
Then a deep sound penetrates the forest. The howl is unbroken and direct. It builds in intensity until it feels as if it is suspended in a long arc from its source to where she stands. Higher cries join in, riding above the first, followed by a percussive flourish of barks. When one call winds down, another layers itself on top so that, so that the pack seems numerous. But she is sure there are only three singing back to her, that they are not far away. She might reach them before either her legs give out or the men pull close enough to fire on her again. She moves. The pain explodes and she feels it everywhere, in her leg, her belly, her teeth, the tip of her snout. Her senses close down so it feels as if she were racing blind except for a prick of brightness in the center of her vision. She aims for that light and runs as hard and as fast as she can. Thank wow. you.